Yeah, I was nervous about teaching in the 60s in front of a military guy <laughs> who teaches like military history. And I'm covering like civil unrest. Oh shit, it's recording. Okay. All right. So, evening class. Um, so this uh, mini lecture is about the turbulent 60s. Um, after I present some information about the 1960s, then we're going to watch two short documentaries um, about some of the events of the 60s, and then we're going to break out into groups and do some discussion, cover some first impressions, and um, hopefully draw some conclusions about what we see. <coughs> um, so first of all, the turbulent 60s is what I've named it, but let's start right here, actually. So I ask the question, what is the 60s? Can you name some ideas or events that pop into mind um, when you think of the 60s? Woodstock. Woodstock? Jimi Hendrix? Jimi Hendrix? <laughs> cool, cool. Um, right on. How about some other things? Maybe along um, political lines or water, Watergate? Watergate was like, uh, that's good because you're thinking Nixon, but that's like early 70s. Kent State? Kent State, yep. Cool. So, Civil rights, exactly. Um, so I, let's move on to the next slide. Um, oh, actually, I wanted to say one other thing, too, before I move on. So I want to ask the question, uh, so I have the 60s in quotes up here, and so we have it kind of as, like, as you guys were able to think of, like, events or ideas from the 60s, we kind of have, like, a mental construct of what the 60s is, is because historians will use that, like, when they talk about it, right? And um, I want to think, how is it, I want to think about how is it distinct from other periods that succeeds or precedes. So, like, let's take the 50s, for example. That's another historical period that we think in terms of. Uh, how is that different? Different standards. Like being in black and white. Uh, yeah. Much more uh, buttoned down world. More sure. organized and clean cut. Yeah. Maybe a bit more uniform. Yeah. Somewhat, somewhat a bit more rigid. So, we already have these certain ideas in our head where we set these periods apart. And I just want to remain cognizant of that when we do talk about the 60s, which is a time period, right? But it's not as simple as, you know, 1960 to December 31st, 1969, right? Okay. So, and then I've named it the turbulent 60s. I mentioned that before, but this also makes another assumption, um, which we just talked about, which is that things were ran a little bit more smoothly or were a bit more organized in uh, the 50s. And the 60s are known for a period of tumult. And so I have a subtitle, Government Dissent in the 1968 Democratic Convention. And that's one more assumption that I make, which is that the Democratic Convention is um, a bellwether of the period. So kind of something that is in microcosm that is reflective of this entire idea that we have of the 60s. And this is just my own um, assumption here. So as we go through, we can question it and um, think about whether it's relevant. Okay, now I'm going to put on some, uh, just some <coughs> images that um, we think about, or we should think about when we think of the 1960s, or at least I think we should think about. In 1960, um, the pill came out, so the birth control pill, which definitely changed the way that people looked at sex. Um, it helped, one could argue, propel the women's movement, and even today it has fans and opponents. Um, then another period that I um, consider pretty important in the 60s is the <coughs> Missile Crisis. And um, this is George C. Scott. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie, but this is Dr. Strangelove. George C. Scott plays, plays a military commander who's advising the president on a nuclear missile crisis, which in, a sense, in essence the Cuban Missile Crisis was. Um, the Soviet Union had moved missiles into, into uh, Cuba, and the whole world was on edge because they thought they were on the verge of nuclear warfare, right? And so this right here is satire, but it depicts the sort of fear that people had at that time. So people were fearful of nuclear warfare and that the world was kind of an unstable place at the time. Um, in 19, uh, August 28th, 1963, there was a march on Washington for jobs and freedom. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech. So that's, all, that's also a sign of the civil rights battle that was going on at the time. November 22nd, 1963, Kennedy was assassinated. Um, and then, about almost a year later, uh, Civil Rights Act was passed, uh, signed by LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, 
with Martin Luther King Jr. on the side, and that, as you know, helped um, ban discrimination in the public sphere, right, in the workplace and schools. Um, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution I put up here as well because this was a resolution based on a crisis in the Gulf of Tonkin. They claim that two U.S. warships were attacked by the U.S. Vietnamese um, Navy, and as a result of this, Congress voted to give uh, LBJ a resolution so that he would be able to escalate um, military presence in Vietnam at the time without declaring war. And from that point onward, he did escalate his military presence there. So we've got civil rights battles, we have war going on, at this, and a, a progressively more unpopular war. So we have anti-war protests. We have the women's liberation movement. Uh, we also have race riots going on. Um, Despite the fact that the Civil Rights Act was passed, we still had um, a lot of racism going on. And I want to say something else about this, too. Um, black dissatisfaction with police brutality in a racist society often exploded into race riots. This is a picture from summer of 1967 in Detroit. In uh, summer of 1967, there were a lot of race riots um, in major cities in the US. And this was a particularly violent one. Um, moving along. There was the Tet Offensive in January 1968. So we're in the year 1968 now, the same year as the Democratic Convention. Uh, the Tet Offensive um, was launched by the National Liberation Front, which was the uh, major group in North Vietnam, uh, supported by the Soviets. And it wasn't very successful, but it caused so much damage and uh, loss of property and life that it turned the tide of American opinion on the war and really made it such that people didn't believe an escalation of the war could bring about a satisfactory cause. And so you had deep <coughs> unsatisfaction about the war at that time. Then shortly thereafter, April 4th, Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated. Um, after Robert Kennedy wins the California primary, um, he is also assassinated. And then we culminate in the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, August 1968. Um, oh, I also have this great quote. We don't want nobody, nobody sent. This is an old phrase from Chicago politics, which basically says, if I don't know who you're working for, I don't care to hear from you. And this was kind of the attitude of Mayor Daley, who put on the convention, who was a power broker in the Democratic Party. And the people who were coming to protest at that time, he didn't care to hear from them. He didn't know who sent them. And he considered them agitators, communists, you name it, terrorists. And then on a more positive note, before I get into the Democratic National we also had the Apollo 11 mission, which got to the moon and back to Earth safely. And of course, Woodstock. Everybody rocked out at the end of the decade. It was cool. Um, so in the Democratic National Convention, let me just run through it real quick. Uh, the party tickets, uh, you don't need to take notes or anything, but Hubert Humphrey was a nominee. Um, you had the slate of candidates right here. Robert Kennedy obviously did not make it because he was assassinated. Um, you know, a lot of party division here, whereas over here in the Republican candidates, you had a coalition that ended up um, coming together behind Richard Nixon. And this um, factionalism in the Democratic Party shows up in Chicago. And then you see some other names down here from 1968 that look more familiar. Ronald Reagan, the President of the Navy, and then George Romney, the father of Mitt Romney. Um, a few things about Richard J. Daley. Um, he was mayor of Chicago for 21 years, and he said coming into the convention that no matter who shows up, law and order will be maintained. How am I doing on time? You guys know? Okay. Um, thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, he was the second most powerful Democrat in the country behind Lyndon Johnson at the time. Uh, he helped JFK win uh, the state of Illinois in 1960 in the presidential election. And he hoped to do the same for the Democratic Party in 1968. And he convinced Johnson to hold the party in Illinois because he said, if you want to win the election in 68, you've got to hold it here so you can get Illinois. As it turns out, Johnson was so unpopular at the time, he decided not to run for re-election because he didn't think it was viable. Um, but he boasted, daily boasted that law and order would be maintained, and he derided protesters as agitators and communists. Um, let's move along. So the protest groups that showed up in Chicago for um, uh, the convention, you have the National Mobilization to End the War in Vietnam, came to be known as NOPE, and then the Yippies, the Youth International Movement. Um, they were led by Abby Hoffman. Do you guys know that name? 
Um, and it was a youth organization that prized free speech, anti-authoritarianism, uh, the kind of countercultural aspects of life, and they employed theatrical tactics to make their points made. So for instance, here they had a mock convention in which Pegasus, an actual live pig, was their nominee. So, um, so I found this quote while I was doing some cursory reading, and it says, you're better off if you both talk different languages, then you're sure you know you're not communicating. And this was from Wesley Pomeroy. He's not a very significant figure in this um, whole scenario, but he was dispatched to Chicago by the U.S. Attorney General to convince Mayor Daley to negotiate with protesters and to provide protest permits. So not only was Daley intent on bulking up his police force and bringing in the National Guard to keep people away from the convention, but he also thought a good tactic to keep protesters away was to not provide <coughs> permits for protests and park usage, right? So they had no space in which to protest legally. So that became a problem. Um, so, from this point, I'd like to move on to our two documentaries that we're going to watch. And um, as, I, as you watch the next two films, I want you to think about some of these events that I showed you, some of the images, and think about government action and civil unrest and how they're both expressed, right? So, for instance, uh, government action to prevent um, what political factionalism or protest, Mayor Daley decided not to issue permits. And then um, civil unrest, you've got people who um, show up and use theatrical um, displays or you know, performances to convey their message, right? And let's see. So I want you to think about those things. What happens when there isn't a space for dissent? And then think about some of the events in the 1960s, both the ones that I show you and the ones that you know already. Um, what are the overriding themes that you see? And then after the films, I want you to do two things. First, we'll get into groups, and then you'll share your first impressions of the films in small groups, how they made you feel. I also want you to think about how the filmmaker uh, depicted these events. Um, even think about uh, the people he chooses to interview, the music that he sets with the score, um, and yeah, where, what kind of face time he gives to the different characters. And then finally, based on what you know, um, I want you to be able to describe why this event might be a bellwether of the 60s, why the Democratic Convention is a microcosm of what was, what's been <coughs> happening during this entire historical period, right, between civil unrest and government action, and war and its unpopularity, and all of those things, okay? And then, if I have enough time. No, I don't. That's 12 minutes. Okay. I don't know. I didn't. 